Hey, welcome. I just wanted to tell everyone we still have a lot of people coming in, so we're going to get started in a little bit, not quite on time. Um, and also, if people in the hallway can hear me, you guys can come sit on the floor in here. And we also have an overflow room in 106. So yeah, thanks for coming, guys.
right, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. So um, thank you guys for coming. We're really excited to have you. My name's Chelsea. Um, I'm a 1776 scholar. We're the ones who are putting this event on tonight. Um, you're going to hear from Scott Klusendorf, who spoke to us in chapel today. He's going to give us um, a talk, and then we're going to have four students come up, and they're going to debate him a little bit, and then we're going to have a Q&A at the end for you guys to ask questions, and we really want this to be an event where you guys can um, challenge yourselves and really develop your own arguments, so I'm going to go ahead and lead us in prayer, and then we're going to have um, Kendall Patterson lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, so please pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us all to gather here tonight. Thank you for allowing us to have these passions wherever we stand on this issue. And we just ask that you keep us safe tonight and you help us to have open minds and open hearts and you help us to be loving and kind as we speak about something that's so sensitive. And I ask that you be with those who are affected by this issue and who may have a personal connection to this that's emotional. And I just thank you for gathering us together once again. Um, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would everyone stand and say the pledge with me? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Right. Um, and now we're going to welcome Mr. Klusendorf. <laughs> Thank you. So here's what I'll do. I'm going to take about 15 minutes and lay out a case for what I believe. I'll give you my reasons, then we'll hear from you uh, and the panel. Uh, I'll take as little time as possible. So I want to begin tonight with an argument, a syllogism that I will defend throughout the course of the evening. Here is my syllogism. By the way, some of you are wondering, what's that big word, syllogism? Uh, it just means premise, premise, conclusion. You use this all the time. When you would argue with your mom and dad, you would use a syllogism. Mom and dad, you said I could drive the car Friday night. It is Friday night. That means I can drive the car. That's a syllogism. Now, they can use it on you as well. They can say, no, driving is contingent upon you getting good grades. Your GPA is currently F+. Plus. Therefore, you will not be driving the car. Syllogisms are simply a way to present our ideas. So here's my pro-life syllogism tonight. Premise one, it's wrong to intentionally kill an innocent human being. It's wrong to intentionally kill an innocent human being. Premise two, abortion intentionally kills an innocent human being. Abortion intentionally kills an innocent human being. Conclusion, therefore abortion is wrong. It's wrong to intentionally kill innocent human beings. Abortion does that, therefore it's wrong. My other thesis tonight is that this debate is not about choice. It's not about privacy. It's not about trusting women. It's not about economic hardship. It's about none of those things. Because when you look at the abortion issue, there's not a divide between those who are pro-choice and those who are anti-choice that decides the issue. We're all pro-choice on a lot of things. I am vigorously pro-choice on women choosing their own health care providers, choosing their own worldview, choosing the careers they wish to pursue, the cars they wish to drive, the guys they wish to date and eventually marry. I'm pro-choice on all those issues. But some choices are wrong, like intentionally killing innocent human beings simply because they're in the way of something we want. That's a choice we shouldn't allow. So this is not a debate between choice versus anti-choice. I'm anti-choice on corporations intentionally dumping pollutants in our rivers. I'm anti-choice on spousal abuse, and I think everybody else in this room is as well. I gather that we're all pro-choice on a whole bunch of things, like which baseball team you wish to root for. It better be the Dodgers. That said, tonight's debate, or discussion shall I say, comes down first and foremost to three questions I want to look at. What is the unborn? What is abortion? 
and what are the alternatives? What is the unborn? My answer is that from the earliest stages of development, you were a distinct, living, and whole human being. Now, people hear that and they go, well, wait a minute, what about 20? That embryo can split into two. And you could end up with not just one embryo, but two. How can you say then you've got a full, whole human being right from the moment of fertilization when it could split into two? Question, how does it follow that because a living entity splits, that it wasn't a whole living entity prior to the split? Have any of you in this room ever cut a flatworm in half? Can I see your hands? How many of you have ever sliced? Okay, the mass murderers are now identifying themselves. What did you get when you sliced the flatworm in half? Two flatworms. Did it follow there was no flatworm prior to the split? So the fact that the living entity splits does not mean it wasn't a whole living entity prior to the split. Other people will say, well, wait a minute. Nature causes miscarriages. Why, up to half of all conceptions spontaneously abort. How can we claim that's a whole living human being when nature itself seems to be triggering abortions? Question, how does it follow that because nature spontaneously triggers a miscarriage that A, the embryos in question are not fully human, or B, we may intentionally kill them? Earthquakes happen in third world countries and kill hundreds of thousands of people. That doesn't justify mass murder. So the fact nature does something tells us nothing about whether it's right or whether it's wrong. You'll also get this objection, which came out last fall. You're in a burning research lab. In that corner over there are a 1,000 frozen embryos. In this corner over here is a six-year-old girl. You're pro-life, all right? Which one are you going to save? says comedian Patrick Tomlinson. He thinks he came up with this on his own. He didn't. Four other philosophers came up with it long before him. He's taking credit, but he doesn't know his literature. Which one are you going to save? You going to save the embryos or the six-year-old girl? Where are we all going? Six-year-old. Tomlinson, Tomlinson says, see, even you don't believe your own pro-life rhetoric, because if you did, you'd at least think about saving the 1,000 embryos. Question. How does it follow that because I save one human over others, that the ones left behind are not fully human? Suppose this building were on fire. I can save all of you or my 18-year-old daughter, Emily Rose. Who is going to burn? <laughs> all of you. Now, I will not shoot you on the way out but I will save her first. By the way, that's the flaw with his thought analysis. His analysis is not about who we get to intentionally kill, which is what abortion is about. It's about who we ought to save. The whole thing is wrong-headed from the beginning. By the way, the President of the United States has the Secret Service. Will the Secret Service take a bullet for the President, yes or no? Yes, will they take it for you? No, does it follow you're less human than the President? No. It just means they have a duty to protect him. That's what they do. It says nothing about your humanity. Philosophically, we have to then ask the question, what is abortion? If the unborn are distinct living and whole human beings, then what is abortion? And I'm not going to give you pro-life sources on this. I'm going to cite sources who disagree with me on abortion, but agree on what abortion itself is. Abortion is the intentional killing of an innocent human being. Peter Singer, the ethicist at Princeton University, says that abortion is intentional killing of human beings. David Boonin, philosopher at University of Colorado, who's written the most intelligent defense of abortion I've ever read, he argues that we know that you were a human being from the very beginning, from the one cell stage, that was not a blob of tissue, that was you, and abortion kills humans, human beings. Feminist Camille Paglia, as I mentioned earlier today, argues that abortion kills concrete individuals, not clumps of cells. To help see what we're looking at when we talk about abortion, I've brought with me tonight a very short clip. It's 55 seconds long. And I want to tell you about the clip and give you the option of not watching it. And then I'm going to tell you exactly what's in it and then tell you how to avoid it. If you watch this clip, here's what you'll see. You will see a first second and third trimester fetus after the abortion procedure. You won't see the procedure done in process. You'll see the aftermath. I want to warn you up front that it's gruesome viewing. 
And to be courteous to you, I've taken the narration out of the clip. If you don't want to watch it, you can simply look away. You won't even hear anything you don't want to hear. I totally respect your right to say, I just don't want to watch that. I just don't. Fair enough. You don't have to leave the room. Avert your gaze for the 55 seconds. You won't even have any part of that presentation. Second thing I want to say, please hear me. I'm not showing this video in place of good reasons. I am making an argument. The pictures are part of it, much the same way juries are shown gruesome photos to understand the nature of a particular crime. It's not for shock value. It's because pictures convey things in a way that words never could. Third thing, and this is crucial, I'm not here tonight, nor was I here this morning, to beat up on people who may have had an experience with abortion. If that's you, and if you were at chapel, I think you already know this about me, I'm a firm believer in the gospel of Jesus. And the great news of the gospel is, men and women, that guilt-ridden people, people who've got all kinds of problems, abortion, porn, disrespect, lying, cheating, those are the people Jesus came to save. And I want you to know that we're not showing this clip to lay a guilt trip on you. We're showing this clip because it conveys evidence we need to look at if we're going to look at this issue honestly. And if you're here and you've had an experience with abortion, I want you to know that if the grace of God was there to save the Apostle Paul who murdered Christians, the grace of God is there to save and forgive you for your sins. That's what I believe. That's what the school stands for. So I want us to keep that good news in mind as we take just a moment to look at this clip. And then I'll wrap up with my final point. Uh, and we'll then open it up to the panel to come up and, and, and talk with me about what I've said. So I think I have to be the one to go over here. Is that right, Walter? I need to go over there and be the, the button pusher. I think I'm locked out. For a moment, I thought I was just stupid. Oh, that I am stupid. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Now I have to figure out. Oh, here we go. Again, if you want to look away, feel the freedom. Visuals like this, as disturbing as they are, have been used in social reform movements for the last 150 years. How many of you have been to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C.? You may recall you come up on the third level, and you kind of wind your way down, and you come up on an engraving right at the beginning of that, that exhibition where you see General Dwight D. Eisenhower, the Supreme Allied Commander, sitting in a Jeep with a pale look on his face. He almost looks sick, and he was sick. What happened was Eisenhower had a Jewish aide who wanted Eisenhower to go look at one of the death camps. And Eisenhower said, I'm prosecuting a war. I don't have time for this. I don't want to look at this stuff. You, I don't even believe they exist. And the Jewish aide badgered him and badgered him until finally, to get rid of the guy, Eisenhower says, fine, I'll go look at one of your camps. And the aide drives him out to Ordorf, one of the most notorious camps. Eisenhower gets out of the Jeep, walks behind two buildings, and after he finishes throwing up for 20 minutes, he comes back to his aide and said, you get every company commander on the 
the phone within 50 miles of this place. I'm told the American soldier doesn't know what he's fighting for. When he sees this, he'll know what he's fighting against. We don't show these pictures to shock people unduly. We show them because they convey evidence that no words ever could. How many of you saw Schindler's List? Saving Private Ryan? Hacksaw Ridge. By the way, I met Desmond Doss. I'll tell you about that later. Um, these films were very graphic, but educators use them because they convey important things that words are powerless to convey, and the same is true with abortion. Feminist Naomi Wolf, who supports abortion, says that when pro-lifers show videos like this, they shouldn't be critiqued for it. Because if the pictures are true, and she admits they are, we ought to admit them as evidence in the Socratic quest for truth rather than hide from the images. I quite agree. Last question before we call up our distinguished panel. We have to answer the question, what makes us valuable? And this morning in chapel, I answered that question by saying what gives us our value is not our functional abilities, but rather our common human nature. You've got two choices in front of you when it comes to human value. You can accept a performance view of human value that says what gives us our rights is our performance, our capabilities, self-awareness, the ability to feel pain, uh, viability, pick whatever trait you want, or you can accept an endowment view. The endowment view says you're not valuable because of traits you have, which by the way, none of us in this room share equally, and that come and go in the course of our lifetimes. Rather, what gives you value is you are endowed with rights as found in the Declaration of Independence from our creator. What that means is you're valuable by nature, not function. What gives you your value is your common human nature that you share with everybody in this room, not some function you perform. If you accept a functional view of human value, you end up with savage inequality. Because whatever trait you pick out is decisive. And by the way, you have to argue why that trait is decisive and not say having a belly button that points out rather than in. You have to then say, how do you account for human equality? Say you pick out self-awareness. If self-awareness is what gives us our value, you have more of it than me, you have more rights than I do. I've got a better option. Each and every human being has an equal right to life in virtue of their humanity, not some function that may come and go. So that then raises the empirical question we started with. Are the unborn valuable human beings? The answer is, if they're human, yes, they are. Because all humans have equal rights and equal value. OK, that's my case. I've abbreviated it to make room for the panel, make room for your questions. So uh, I don't know where's my, at this point, I'll turn it over to what's going to happen next. And I get to sit here and get grilled, which will be fun. All right, thank you. Let's give them a round of applause. All right, so now we're going to have four students come up, and they are going to ask questions from the pro-choice standpoint. Um, I would like to give a little disclaimer that whatever they say on this panel does not necessarily reflect their personal views. Um, so we're going to have them come up now. And we're also going to have Dr. Shoemaker come and moderate for us. All right. Let me say this. This is really impressive. So many faces um, and a wonderful presentation in chapel and I mean, these past few minutes. So, okay, so I'm gonna try to stay out of the way as much as possible and turn things over here and let our students unleash their questions. Let's just start with Courtney in the back and we'll then I'll work our way around toward the front. Um, yeah, I just want to emphasize that uh, at the end of this, you're probably not going to like us on the panel if you're pro-choice or pro-life, sorry. Um, please don't take that out on us because this is hard to do for us. Um, so let's pick a question, shall we? The biggest thing that I've struggled with, and um, for a lot of you who actually know me, I was very, very, very pro-choice um, before coming to CCU and learning a little bit more about the issue. So one of the biggest things that's bothered me growing up um, is... Like you said, abortion is the tensional life of 
uh, the intentional taking of a human life. Um, but my problem is, is it wrong to intentionally place a child into an environment where they are not wanted, where there's a broken foster care system, where people who go into adoption are statistically more likely to commit suicide? Is it just as wrong as intentionally taking a life as intentionally placing someone into a life they didn't want? You're right that these are heartbreaking situations. These children that don't have homes, uh, being unwanted is terrible. However, the homeless are unwanted, but we don't kill them. Notice what this objection assumes. It assumes the unborn are not human. Nobody suggests killing two-year-olds that are unwanted. Nobody says, hey, if this kid by the time he's five will be rejected by everybody, let's just kill him now. Nobody would propose that. They only propose that with the unborn because they assume that the unborn are not human like that toddler, which is question begging on their part because they're assuming the very thing they're trying to prove. So yes, unwantedness is painful. Yes, it's terrible. But nobody suggests killing two-year-olds or teenagers for that. It may, well, maybe parents of teenagers, but not. But you get the idea. All right, I need to step in here and stop. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so we can say as pro-lifers that our hearts break for these children. And thankfully, there are pro-life organizations that step in to help with this. And your concern about that is not misplaced at all. We do need to reform the system and fix it. I'm simply saying intentionally killing innocent human beings is immeasurably worse than someone being Ill, Ill, not wanted. Maybe a quick follow-up question. Uh, where could our students go to to find these organizations, Christian organizations that uh, step in? What are some prominent names or websites? Or all right, first of all, let's talk about the pregnancy care centers that are out there. Let me give you three main networks that do that. CareNet, Heartbeat, and NIFLA. CareNet oversees about 400 or more evangelically-based pregnancy centers. They help the mother uh, while she's pregnant and also help her afterward and help with parenting courses so the kids aren't unwanted. They pull dads in and say, hey, Dude, man up, let's help you be a good dad here. You got a family now, Let, let's help you do that. And they do, and they do. Heartbeat is a little more ecumenical. It's, it's uh, probably two thirds Catholic, but there are evangelical centers within Heartbeat and they also focus on family issues after uh, the child is born. Uh, thirdly, NIFLA, National Institute of Family Life Advocates, what they do is they provide legal covering for these centers so that they can do their work, they can help place children for adoption, help families go that route if they want to, and do so without getting sued by people who don't like what they're doing. So there's just three right there. Thank you. Just a quick follow-up. Love the answer. Um, so a lot of the pro-choice movement is so frustrated with the conservative Christians because we say they're alternatives. You can adopt, you can go into foster care, we'll take them, yet there are no Christians that seem to be wanting to do this. So how do we as a Christian community fight that, that feeling of apathy and saying somebody else will take care of it because clearly nobody is? You may have information I don't have, so I uh, am not going to state that I know for sure I'm right on this, and the last data I saw is a couple of years old. You may have better data, so I'll hedge what I'm about to say by making that acknowledgement. From what I have read, babies do not wait for homes. They just don't. In fact, even disabled and crack babies, there's a waiting list of families wanting those children. You know what the problem is? Bureaucratic red tape. A government system that makes it very difficult to get children. Now, if you think this is far-fetched, think for a minute. Where do people in America go today to get children? China, Russia, why? And by the way, some of them have to sell their homes to afford these adoption procedures. They're horribly expensive. You drop 10 grand up front, 50 grand when you get there, and then You've spent all that money, then they say, oh, there's these other fees you don't know about. I mean, I've got friends who have adopted children there, and they have paid through the nose for it. Uh, so I'm not convinced, though you could have information I don't, that um, Christians are, are being stingy here. I actually think we're more generous than we give ourselves credit for on this. Um, at least that's my take from what I've seen. Okay, hello. So I'm going to offer a uh, different sort of angle. Um, and uh, so there were methods of abortion in biblical times. Um, this is just, just I'm going to say this right now, but 
Um, I have some follow-up that I'm going to do after I um, ask this. So how do you deal with the fact that nowhere in the Bible is abortion specifically condemned as murder? Um, God does not explicitly condemn elective abortion or declare it's obje objectively morally wrong or evil. Um, and here's a scenario from Exodus 21, uh, verse 22. If people are fighting and hit a pregnant woman, she gives birth prematurely, footnote, had a miscarriage, there is no serious injury. The offender must be fined whatever the woman's husband demands and the court allows. Um, so, um, obviously, murder is not allowed. And punishment during these times, Numbers 35, verse 30 through 31 says, If anyone kills a person, the murderer shall be put to death on the evidence of witnesses. So, why is the life of the mother in this scenario valued higher than the life of the unborn baby who dies? Um, this is an argument that has been brought up towards me a little bit. So, All right, there's really three arguments in that question. That, uh, let me take the first one, that the Bible nowhere condemns abortion, nowhere says you can't have one. Are you suggesting that whatever the Bible does not expressly condemn, it condones? No. Okay. For example, does the Bible say anywhere, thou shalt not use neighbor for shark bait? <laughs> no. No. Can we use neighbor for shark bait? Sure. What, sure? OK. <laughs> um, where are the school counselors? Uh, you don't need an argument. You need a shrink. No. Uh, <laughs> we're going to have fun tonight, by the way. You're worried this, we are going to have fun, believe me. Um, the fact that the Bible does not expressly mention something does not mean it condones it. I'm going to go a step further. I'm going to make your argument even better than the way you, you phrased it. I'm going to concede that nowhere does the Bible condemn abortion, and nowhere does it teach the unborn or human. And I'm going to argue the Bible is still pro-life. So here's how I'm going to do it. Scripture says that all humans have intrinsic value because they bear the image of God. Genesis 1 teaches this. James chapter 4, for example, teaches this. Premise 2, because humans bear the image of God, the shedding of innocent blood, meaning the intentional killing of innocent human beings, is strictly forbidden. Exodus 23, 7, Proverbs 6, 16 to 19, Matthew 5, 21, to name a few. What's the only question left in this as pertains to abortion? Are the unborn human? If they are... The same commands against the shedding of innocent blood apply to them as they do everybody else. Nowhere in Scripture does it say Canadians are human. <laughs> Nowhere in Scripture does it say Americans are human. Nowhere in Scripture does it say the French are human. Some of you are going, that's biblical truth. Uh, <laughs> the fact is that lots of groups aren't mentioned, but Scripture says all humans bear the image of their maker. If I'm right that the science of embryology shows the unborn are one of us, then they too are image bearers, and intentionally shedding their blood would be prohibited by Scripture. Now, why is Scripture silent on abortion? And then I'll talk about Exodus 21. You threw a lot at me. That was a, you know, a lot. Um, why isn't abortion mentioned? Short answer. The Hebrews of the Old Testament and the early Christians of the New were not killing their children the way the surrounding pagan nations were through abortion. Now, God's people did put their, their children in the fire to Moloch, but abortion wasn't an issue in ancient Israel. And here's why. Let's think about this for a moment. Think about ancient Israel. You are surrounded by very angry pagan enemies. You took their land. They want it back. You are a minority. Do you need a lot of people or just a few? You need a lot to defend yourself. Secondly, is barrenness a curse or a blessing in the Old Testament? It's a curse. Remember Samuel's mother? She's pleading with God at the altar, give me an offspring. If you were barren and you were a woman, there was no worse that you could get than that. That was the ultimate. You would rather have a few kids and die. At least you were viewed honorably. This was the worst curse for a woman. Second, thirdly, God gives Israel a mandate to not only replenish themselves for their own benefit, but because God was going to use Israel to do what? Bless all nations of the entire earth. Now, let's think about this just for a moment. 
In a nation where barrenness is a curse, not a blessing, where you're surrounded by evil empires that want to invade you and take you over, and where God has given you a mandate to be fruitful and multiply so you can bless all nations of the earth, is abortion going to get a foothold in that culture? No. So there's, there's a reason why we don't see the word mentioned. And the early Christians in the New Testament carried over that Hebrew mindset. Uh, and remember, the first Christians were Jewish Christians with a Jewish morality. So they just absorbed that, took it right in. Now, it's interesting, early Christian literature like the Didache and the Sentences of Pseudo Facilities and other, uh, I don't know if I said that right, but whatever that document was called with that name, um, they do condemn abortion. Early um, literature that's not in, in our canon does. Exodus 21, you, you brought that up. Two guys are duking it out. They inadvertently collide with a pregnant woman who's standing there enjoying the show. Why? I don't know, but she is. And they cause her to bring forth her child, the text says. All of the translations, with the exception of the Jerusalem Bible and the reviled standard, I mean the revised standard version, uh, say... <laughs> That was a bad joke. It's going to go down faster than the Rockies next year. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> I'm a Dodgers fan. We're down 2-0. Pray for us. Um, all the translations indicate that the punishment for harming the child, the lex talionos, applies equally to the mother and the child, not just the mother. But let's put that aside for a moment. How does it follow that because two guys are duking it out and they cause a woman to unintentionally miscarry, that we may intentionally kill that child? It's a non sequitur. In other words, it simply doesn't follow. It also doesn't prove the child in the womb isn't human because even if there were a lesser penalty for harming him than his mother, that has no bearing on his humanity. How do we know that? In that same passage of Exodus 21, a master beats his slave, and the slave uh, lives, and the master gets no penalty at all for beating the slave. In other words, you could do what you want with a slave, basically. Does that mean the slave isn't fully human because the penalty was less than it would have been if he had harmed the master? No. So we have to be very careful exegetically that we don't read too much into these passages. So, Could you just follow up there on the... Explain more fully why it's a non sequitur. A non sequitur means that just because we have this premise, what allegedly follows from it doesn't. So in the case of Exodus 21, we have a case where two guys accidentally harm an unborn human entity. Abortion is not accidental harm. With abortion, we not only foresee the death of the unborn, we intend it. These two guys are fighting. They don't intend any harm. They just collide with a mother and cause her to miscarry. In that situation, it's a non sequitur to say that because there's a lesser penalty for uh, unintentionally harming the child versus his mother, that that means it's permitted to go ahead and intentionally kill the child. Thank you. And that would also be consistent with the fact that accidental death of adults mm -hmm. isn't punished as murder. Correct. Yeah, good. Thank you. Okay. Uh, this is a tough panel, man. Um, okay, I just have one last question. Um, when it comes to policy, um, would you be willing to make a compromise? Tell me what you mean. I, I don't understand. I suppose if you could get um, late trimester abortions banned um, as a step, is that something that you would make? Uh, yes. Compromise? I'm an incrementalist. In other words, if you are committed to protecting all children in law, but you don't have the votes to do it, but you have the votes to protect some, you do the greatest good you can given the political realities in front of you. There are some fringe pro-life groups out there that say if you do that, you're compromising, that you're deciding which children live and die. No, we're not. No pro-lifer has the power to decide which children live and die. The Supreme Court has already said no unborn children have a right to life. None. They've all been determined to be disposable property. When laws are passed restricting that, who's doing the compromising, them or us? They are. They are. We're protecting as many as we can given the political realities in front of us. And this is what you do if you're a pro-life voter. In a broken, fallen world, whether it's pro-life or other issues of justice, in a broken, fallen world, we seldom get everything we hope to get. In that broken, fallen world, we're going to promote the good and limit the evil 
as much as we can given the constraints on us. Everybody with me on that? So it's not compromise. I do support incremental legislation as long as we're not saying we want to stop there and protect no others. But if that's all I can do for the moment, you bet I'm going to do it. Thank you. So in nations that follow your advice and um, outlaw abortion, we still see very high abortion rates because of illegal abortions that either take place in uh, medical facilities that are doing it under the radar or back alley gruesome abortions with coat hangers and things like that that are either situation, it's incredibly dangerous for women. So it seems like even if we do outlaw abortion, it's not particularly effective and it just increases the risk to women who are in really desperate situations. You're absolutely right about one thing and wrong about another. You're right that any woman who dies from an abortion, illegal or legal, is a tragedy. And as pro-lifers, we mourn that. You're right about that. However, you're wrong that the empirical evidence points to laws restricting abortion causing women to die in the back alleys from illegal abortions. Uh, the first problem I have with that argument is that Atlantic Magazine came out last week with an article saying that the worldwide uh, fervor over dangerous illegal abortions that we've been hearing about for 40 years was all a big lie and they had no empirical evidence to back it up. Rather, it was simply abortion rights groups like Planned Parenthood, NARAL, uh, the Religious Coalition for Reproductive Choice, feeling that this could happen. But when pressed for the actual numbers, they couldn't do it. Now, let's keep in mind, many of these third world countries do not even have an apparatus in place to keep track of their population. They can't even pull off a census, let alone determine how many people are dying from illegal abortion. But there's a deeper problem here. They're comparing apples with oranges. Uh, they're trying to make the point that somehow correlation proves causation, and, and that is simply fallacious to argue that way. Just because, let's say it were true that women in India would die in that third world country from laws restricting abortion. It doesn't mean it would happen here. What we would need to do is look at nations that are similarly constituted to our own and see what happened there. Uh, you would need to look at Great Britain, for example, Canada, maybe. Uh, but to, to say it's some third world country that's going to forecast what happens here I is simply false. In fact, in this country in 1976, when the Hyde Amendment cut off federal funding for abortion, we were told that poor women would die in the back alleys of America because they couldn't get the abortions they were craving and would demand. And guess what? It didn't happen. Instead, the abortion rate went down because we weren't funding it at the federal level. Uh, this is what we need to be careful of, that we don't make statements we can't substantiate. But there's an even deeper problem with the argument you bring up. Notice what it assumes about the unborn. It assumes the unborn are not human. Because otherwise what you're arguing is, is that because some people will die attempting to intentionally kill other innocent people, the state ought to make it safe and legal to do it. But why should the law be faulted for making it more risky to intentionally kill one human being over another? I have a problem with that. Once again, we're assuming the unborn are not one of us. Now, pro-lifers in the crowd, please listen to me. When the question of illegal abortion is brought up, do not do what some pro-lifers do. Well, only 39 women died from illegal abortion in prior to Roe v. Wade in 1972. Um, I'm sorry for stepping out of character here, but honestly, we need to show some empathy. If we are Christians, do we care that people are harmed by abortion? Yeah, we do, we do. It should break our hearts. So we don't wanna just go into to, to statistic mode, which I've heard pro-lifers do, and say, well, that never happened because the CDC said only 29 women died from, or 39 women died from illegal abortion in 72. I think that number's probably underreported, but it's certainly not five to 10,000 a year. Uh, and let me give you another source for this while I'm at it. Dr. Mary Calderon, Planned Parenthood's own medical director during the 1960s, said in an American Journal of Public Health article in August of 1960 that the death rate from illegal abortion was so low it wasn't even worth commenting on. Now this was allegedly when women were dying in America from illegal abortions. She said it wasn't happening. That's Planned Parenthood's medical director. Christopher Teets, 
Planned Parenthood statistician said the claim of thousands of women a year dying from illegal abortion prior to Roe v. Wade was, quote, unmitigated nonsense. I will cite another pro-choice source for this. Dr. Daniel Callahan, author of the book Abortion, Choice, and Morality, said that at best 500 women a year died from illegal abortion, not 5,000, not 10,000. Uh, fourth pro-choice source, Dr. Lawrence Later and Bernard Nathanson, co-founders of NARAL, National Abortion Rights Action League, admit that they inflated the numbers to five to 10,000 deaths a year and sold it to a sympathetic press to get the population on board for liberalizing abortion laws. There's simply no empirical evidence women were dying by the thousands each year from illegal abortion. It wasn't there. It didn't happen. So. A quick then, uh, what website would you recommend for students to go to to kind of go back and better understand these facts? Well, website, forget that. They should buy my book and make me rich. No, I'm kidding. Um, <coughs> sarcasm's my middle name, I'm sorry. Um, seriously, uh, next week, you can go there now and find some of this, caseforlife.com. Now, what you don't know is caseforlife.com at the end of next week is going through a massive upgrade. And we have whole new stuff in there. It's a minimal site right now. But you will find the information I just gave you on illegal abortion in there. Um, or you can get it from my book, The Case for Life, uh, if you want. Great question. Thank you. I want to just address, um, a, a, I think, a really sticking point for a lot of people on both pro-life and the pro-choice side, um, which is dealing with situations where um, rape or incest or even situations where the mother's life may be in danger, where um, many individuals would say, yeah, I'm, I'm really pro-life, but I just don't know how to make that connection on those issues because how can that person have a choice? Or even on the pro-choice side, when they are truly pro-choice. They really are just advocating for the woman to be able to have that choice, and that had been taken from her. So how do you respond um, to, to kind of that, that argument in, in, in that way? Can I treat the issue of rape and the life of the mother separate because they are somewhat separate? So I'm going to go ahead and deal yeah, with that. Yeah, absolutely. Let me, let me take the rape issue first. First of all, I hope everybody in this room and in the overflow agrees that any woman who's been sexually assaulted has suffered a terrible injustice. And our laws need to reflect that, both in the prosecution side and on the help side. And I think we all agree that that woman has suffered in a way that it's very possible her child will remind her of what she went through. Now, I'm admitting something a lot of pro-lifers don't want to admit. I've heard pro-lifers very insensitively say the following, well, if she just gives birth, she'll be all right. And they cite this bogus study that came out 40 years ago that had all of seven participants in it uh, to make the point that if she just has the baby, she'll be okay. Really? No, I think she's been assaulted. I think she's suffered a terrible thing, and it's likely to bother her for the rest of her life. You don't get over that. You don't get over that. Uh, let's not minimize uh, the truth that we see in movements like the Me Too movement. They're, they are onto something here, and we should acknowledge that. So now the question becomes this. Given we all agree, I hope, that a woman who has been sexually assaulted may indeed have painful memories of that every time she sees her kid, how should a civil society treat innocent human beings who remind us of a painful event. Is it OK to kill them so we can feel better? I guess what I'm putting out there, does hardship justify homicide? There was a story, you may have seen it. I, do, I don't know if you saw this two weeks ago. A woman, I'm not even sure where this was, if somebody knows enlighten me. She was out in a field with her baby and a monstrous hailstorm came. I mean, they were dropping grapefruit. And this woman shielded her baby and saved her baby's life, but you should see the pictures of her body. I mean, just, I mean, it's, it's too hard to look at almost. And she didn't say, oh, I have bodily autonomy, too bad, you're on your own. 
she shielded her kid, and we applaud that. Now, why do we applaud that? Because in us, there is an intuition that it is better to suffer evil rather than inflict it. If I wake up tomorrow morning and there's garbage all over my front lawn, can I just scoop it over onto your lawn so I don't have to deal with it? And the answer is no, I will have to deal with it. Um, an illustration close to home, both my oldest boys were US Army. One was deployed at DMZ in Korea, one 10 months in Afghanistan. My, my son in Afghanistan, suppose he and his company, they saw combat twice, gets captured by the Taliban. And the leader of the Taliban says, if, you do, if you'll help us torture and interrogate your own men, we won't torture you, Tyler. Can he take that deal? He'll choose to suffer evil rather than inflict it. And that's the moral principle in play here. Now, having said that, I'm not saying that that answer feels good. I'm asking what is the morally correct thing? Is it okay to intentionally hurt people who remind us of something painful? Now, sometimes, the, you, not you, but sometimes people will bring this up and they don't want a logical, they're just trying to make the pro-lifer look bad. So when someone comes at you, those of you that are pro-life, and says you're just a cruel, inhumane person that you would force this woman to do this, I cannot believe you would do this, I, I will often call their bluff. And I will simply say, okay, for the sake of argument, I'm gonna grant that we allow abortion in cases of rape. It's not my position, but for the sake of this discussion, let's grant it. Will you now join me in opposing all other abortions? What's their answer? No, women have a fundamental right to an abortion for any reason they want. Okay, defend that position. Don't hide behind rape victims. They need to defend their own turf rather than disguise their own position. By the way, I always find this interesting when people who support abortion as a fundamental right bring up rape. At best, it would justify rape for, or it would, at best, it would justify abortion for rape, not for any reason the woman wants. I mean, otherwise, what you're basically saying is that because you might have to run a red light rushing a loved one to the hospital, we ought to get rid of all traffic laws. Uh, that just doesn't follow. So there's the rape issue. Life of the mother. There actually is a case that presents a life-threatening uh, situation to the mother. Uh, ectopic pregnancy. This is where the embryo implants on the inner wall of the fallopian tube rather than the uterine cavity. If you do nothing, and you can check this out at the CDC, Mayo Clinic, go to any website you want, ectopic pregnancy is a grave threat to the mother. The embryo is in a pathological environment it cannot live in, and it will kill the mother because as that tube bursts, what's gonna happen to the mother? She hemorrhages to death. You have to intervene. You're a pro-life doctor. Do you do nothing and let two humans die? Or do you act in such a way that you save one life even though the unintended but foreseen result is the death of the embryo? I'm gonna save the mother. I can't save the embryo, but I can save the mother. The embryo will die in his pathological condition that he's in right now. I, can, I can't save him, but I can save the mother. So I, I do the greatest good I can. Now, some people say, well, that's abortion. No, let's go back to my syllogism. Abortion is what? The intentional killing of an innocent human being. In this case, we foresee the death of the embryo. We do not intend it. Therefore, I would say that's not abortion. A quick follow-up um, on that note. Um, that, that specifically in the situation where it would kill both the mother and it's a, a situation where the, the baby would not be able to survive. What about in a situation where the baby would be able to survive but it would kill the mother in the process? Yeah. Well, the good news is empirically we do not face that as a situation today. But we did 150 years ago. Uh, right now today I am aware of no medical condition where late term like that we have to kill the unborn to save the mother because we can do what a c-section we don't have to intentionally kill the child we can do premature delivery but let's say it were 150 years ago and uh the mother you you had a situation where the mother's pelvic cavity was too small and the baby was too big if you you, you have a, a brutal choice in front of you do you dismember the child in the womb and remove him piecemeal through the cervical cavity? Or do you break the mother's, I'm sorry for being 
graphic here, or do you break the mother's pelvic cavity open, which kills her, so you can deliver the child? And in that situation, though the child does not intend the mother any harm, the truth is he is killing her. He is killing her. And I think in that situation, it would be the mother's decision whether she wants to act in self-defense or not. And I can't say it would be morally wrong either way. Only in that rare situation, which we do not face today. Everybody clear on that? That's the best I can do with that one. Do we have time for one more question? OK, can I, can I sneak one in? Is that all right? Uh, let's say for impossible that... Faculty privilege. <laughs> that's, that's right. Um, let's say that uh, we were able to pass a law across the United States that abortion would become illegal. However, let's say that it's passed and only 60% of the population believe this. And so there would be plenty, thousands and maybe millions of women who would fiercely disagree. Uh, could you give us some insight into what the penalty for abortion could be, should be, because it's complicated by the fact that these people really don't believe they're committing a crime. The penalty is going to depend on whether there's been a meeting of the minds. Let me explain or unpack what I mean by that. In order to prove co-conspiracy, meaning hold the mother as responsible for the act of abortion as you do the abortionist, you would have to show in a court of law that her knowledge of the act matched his. Everybody with me on, on this so far? Historically, no pro-life bills have proposed similar penalties for the abortionist and the mother. In fact, they've been quite lenient toward the mother. Why is that? Who are they after? Who is the law really after here? The supplier or the user? The supplier. By the way, isn't this what we do with drugs all the time? We punish suppliers differently than we punish users, generally. Why? Because if you get at the supply train, you stop it getting to the user. How are you going to convict an abortion doctor when the only witness against him is the mother? If the penalty for the mother equals that of the doctor. <clears throat> so pragmatically speaking, prudentially, the law has historically said there's a lesser penalty for the woman than there is the doctor. Now, to prove co-conspiracy, you're going to have to show, and this is tough to prove, it's one of the toughest things to overcome in a court of law. To prove co-conspiracy and that there was a meeting of the minds, you're going to have to show she understands the abortion act at the level he does. What woman does? Almost none. In fact, Dr. Warren Hearn, in his book, Abortion Practice, the medical teaching text that teaches doctors how to perform abortions says that when doctors perform abortions, they should have a fetal monitor measuring the heart rate, a Doppler, but that Doppler should be inaudible to the mother. The ultrasound machine should also be turned out of her view. In other words, there's an intentional step here of keeping her in the dark. Why? Because it would be troubling for her. So clearly, the mother doesn't know everything. But here's the interesting thing. Let's say pro-lifers, that you don't buy anything I just said for why the laws were less for the mother than the doctor. Suppose you just think pro-lifers are inconsistent. How would it follow that the syllogism I gave you was wrong? It's wrong to intentionally kill innocent human beings. Abortion does that. Therefore, it's wrong. Suppose pro-lifers are unwilling to consistently apply their ethic. It wouldn't follow that A, the unborn aren't human, or B, we may intentionally kill them. That would still be wrong. A century and a half ago, many people raised the issue with slavery. Hey, you northern white abolitionists, you want to make sure slaves have full rights? What are you going to do? You're gonna, are you going to prosecute slave owners uh, for what they did in the past? Uh, how are you going to take care of all these slaves that you now want to be free? And they suggested that the law would not be able to accommodate the influx of a new class of human beings. And I think we know that that is simply not true. We may not have gotten it perfectly. We may have needed to take more time to work out some monstrous things like getting rid of, getting rid of Plessy 
getting rid, I will now go to speech therapy, getting rid of <coughs> Plessy versus Ferguson and other terrible Supreme Court decisions, but we did get, you know, we worked that out. So I don't know if that's what you were asking, but. Thank you, and thank you to our students. All right. Thank you, panel. All right, thank you to our panel and to Dr. Shoemaker. We're now gonna open it up to you guys so you guys can do some Q&A with Mr. Klusendorf. Um, so we have some mic runners who are gonna come grab these. <laughs> Never mind, he has some. Okay. Um, so if you have questions, oh, here we have a question. Um, so I'm Ben Meyer, I'm a senior here at CCU, and I think the issue that I run into the most in terms of discussing this issue with people who are pro-choice is a disagreement on what the fundamental issue is. Um, and we as pro-lifers can argue that, well, the right to life and whether or not the embryo is a life is the fundamental issue. But for them, it seems to appear that the fundamental issue is whether or not the, women, the woman's right to choice and her right to do with her body is the fundamental issue for them. So how do we reconcile this if we're basically two ships passing in the night on what is the issue we're arguing? And even the quotations you mentioned from pro-choice pro people even acknowledge that, okay, the, per, the embryo is a life but we're key, we care essentially more about the uh, woman's right to her body. So how do we justify these two arguments if they aren't really addressing each I mean, they kind of are in a roundabout way, but it seems like the argument about whether or not the embryo is a human is not quite meeting their argument of whether or not the choice is more important. Right. Uh, what, there's two types of people who bring up bodily rights arguments. There's bodily rights arguments at the street level. Can I drop this? Let's see. There we go. That was risky. Um, there's bodily rights arguments at the street level, and there's a bodily rights argument at the academic level. Let me dice them out for you. The street level argument goes like this. A woman has a right to control her own body. It's her body. She can do what she wants. And they just assert that. Well, it's a very foolish argument. Uh, we know the unborn has its own blood type often, DNA, different from each of his parents. By the way, if the unborn is part of the mother's body, that means a pregnant woman has four arms, four eyes, two noses, and if she's carrying a male child, she has something else interesting. <laughs> so we, we can show that this is foolish on their part. That's the R-rated answer for the evening. You can now all go home. Um, <laughs> there's a more sophisticated bodily rights argument, though, that was first put forward by Judith Jarvis Thompson at MIT. Thompson says, let's grant that the unborn are human. Let's grant that they're persons with the right to life. Let's grant that. Huge admission, by the way. However, she argues, it does not follow that just because you're a human with a right to life, you can use the body of another person to support your own life. And to make sure we understand her point, she spins a famous violinist tale some of you have heard. She says, imagine you wake up one morning and find yourself surgically connected to a world-famous violinist who's been put there by the Society of Music Lovers. And this violinist has a kidney ailment and needs your blood type for the next nine months and needs your, the use of your body to survive, after which you are free to disconnect and he will live, he will be cured. But till then, because he's a person with a right to life and because you're the only one who can support him, you're morally obligated to do that. Thompson then says, it would certainly be nice if you did that, but must you? That ought to throw you back a little bit. I mean, that's a pretty bold face. I mean, someone grants your major premise and says you're still wrong, listen up. <laughs> They're brave, okay? Now, I think her argument is unassailable if the parallel between you being hooked up to that stranger violinist is morally relevant and parallel to a mother being hooked up to her own child. If it is, I see no way around her argument. As you might imagine, I don't think it works. I, I don't have time to unpack all of it, so I'll just give you a couple of talking points here. I could do a whole lecture on this, this argument. And by the way, it is, it's the best the other side has, in my view. I think it's their, their strongest argument. And too many pro-lifers just dismiss it. Uh, there are pro-lifers who treat uh, people on the other side rather uncharitably. They, they just think, oh, they're just dumb baby killers. That is not true. You should never say it that way. I think they're mistaken, but I would never treat them that way. 
Number one reason I think this fails. What is the violinist dying of in Thompson's parallel? What's killing him? His underlying pathology, right? What kills the unborn in abortion? We intentionally kill him. Frank Beckwith puts it well. He says, calling abortion merely the withholding of support is kind of like suffocating someone with a pillow and calling it the withdrawing of oxygen. There's a lot more going on here than just withholding support. Uh, secondly, why should anybody think that just because the tenants use my house, I can kill the tenants? She doesn't really give a real strong argument for that. It's, it's kind of assumed. And this is why Marianne Warren, who is another pro-choice philosopher, thinks that Thompson's bodily rights argument falls apart. And another problem with the bodily rights argument is if bodily rights are absolute, a lot of devastating counterexamples start to come into play. Uh, for example, imagine a mother is pregnant and she's suffering from morning sickness, really bad, and she goes to her physician and asks for thalidomide to reduce the symptoms. Thalidomide causes children to be born with limbs that are severely deformed. And she goes to her doctor and the doctor says, I can't give you this uh, because if I do, it's gonna cause your child to be born with flippers instead of arms. The mother says, forget you, and she takes it anyway. And five months later, gives birth to a child with no arms. Do we think that mother did wrong? Under Thompson's scenario, I don't see how. It's her choice. Her body is sovereign over every other consideration. Thompson argues also that we have no explicit responsibilities to offspring simply in view of genetics. In other words, just because you're genetically related to your offspring does not mean you have any special obligations to them. Uh, you only have them if you voluntarily assume them, which means on her argument, you could give birth to a baby and abandon it in the woods and leave it for the bears because you don't voluntarily assume that. It also means I can abandon my aging parents and leave them to fend for themselves in their old age because after all, biology confers no special responsibilities on me. I think we find these arguments horrific when we stop to think about them. So, although Thompson's argument is an interesting thought experiment, I think it leaves us with a horrific nightmare scenario where might makes right and I get to have an abortion simply because I want it with no further justification needed because my body is sovereign. Does that help? I could say more and I'll say more afterward if you want. So I'm Bailey, I'm a freshman here. And before I moved here, I was um, researching the abortion laws here in Colorado. And as far uh, as I know, there are pretty much no anti-abortion laws here. So what can we do as college students here, specifically in Colorado, to impact the horrible injustices happening in our state to actively impact the laws and um, actual clinics performing um, these abortions. Are you registered to vote? Yes. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, if you are pro-life, your uh, voting day is the seventh. If you're not, it's the eighth. <laughs> it's a joke. Okay, <laughs> seriously, um, I cannot stress enough how important political involvement is. Uh, it's true that politics is downstream from culture, but it's also true that the law acts as a moral teacher. Uh, think about where we are. Well, actually, you're too young to think about this. When I was growing up, cigarette commercials were everywhere. Everywhere. Cigarettes were just a common part of life. Nobody thought a thing of them. You went in restaurants, airplanes. There was a smoking section in the plane. That there was no divider between the non-smokers and the smokers, which meant the whole plane was a smoking section, really. Uh, but, I mean, you could whip out a cigar on a 747 and have at it. Nowadays, you'd be shot if you did that, right? <laughs> the laws have shaped how the public thinks about things. And so whenever we are able to enact legislation that limits the evil of abortion, we're teaching moral lessons to the culture. So I would say the first thing is exercise your right as a citizen to vote. Secondly, I think every one of us in this room that is pro-life, here goes, we're all apologists now. An apologist is not someone who runs around and says he's sorry all the time. Husbands do that. <laughs> we'll deal with you self-righteous ladies later. Um, 
What I mean is an apologist is someone who gives a defense for what he or she believes. We're commanded in scripture to always be ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within us. When you go back this summer to your hometowns, how many of you were part of church youth groups and before you came to, okay. I want you to go find your church youth group. I want you to go find your youth pastor and say, I would like to talk to the youth one Wednesday night or Sunday morning about this issue. And you email me and I will set you up with a pretty little presentation that will convince them. Let's say you didn't know how to do anything else than push the play button on that video I just showed. Do you think that would impact a lot of people? You better believe it. You better believe it. Uh, when when um, Abraham Lincoln was debating slavery and he was making the case for the humanity of the slave, uh, he, some of his abolitionist friends came to him and said, Mr. President, Frederick Douglass being the, the primary one, Mr. President, your arguments are great, but what this nation needs right now is fire, not logic. Because the moral conscience of the nation has been severed and we've got to get it back. And we're not going to get it back just talking philosophy here. So we don't use pictures in place of good reasons, but we use pictures as valuable adjuncts to good reasons. I doubt any of you have ever sat in a Holocaust lecture and not seen pictures or the Vietnam War. Why? To manipulate you? No, because the pictures convey truth that words alone can't. So there's two things. Vote, go to your church youth groups when you get back home. Uh, and how many of you attend churches in this area? All right, go to those churches and tell them. And um, I, I mean, if you seriously, if you email me and say, I and here's my email address, I give it out, I spread it far and wide. It's real easy, you won't forget it. ScottKlusendorf at gmail.com. How hard is that? ScottKlusendorf, gmail.com. You eat. Kong, calm. You email me, I will send you what you need to say, and it will be short and sweet. You can do it in 15 minutes or less, and you will change lives. Great question. Thank you. Um, so when it comes to this pro-choice, pro-life issue, um, as Christians, we have God's view of sex. And as we all know, that's the necessary component to pregnancy. Um, where this, this issue... I didn't know that. Yeah, so just, you know, pointing that out. Um, anyway, I kind of view, personally, the, the pro-choice movement as more of an, um, a movement that is uh, anti-accountability, um, in a sense. You know, there's a culture in, in America and around the world. Um, we really seek, you know, casual sex. We... we to completely distort God's definition of sex and the meaning of sex. Um, and I just don't see many people making that argument to the secular scene. So I guess my question for you is, is that a valid argument as Christians to make that, you know, really when it boils down to it, you, you are wanting to use your body and not be held accountable for the, the necessary things that come out of that. Um, and if that is a valid argument as Christians to make to the secular uh, agenda, how do we go about that if, it, if you think it's worth it, I guess? I'm a firm believer in keeping the main thing the main thing. So if I'm talking about abortion, I'm not talking about birth control. I'm not talking about premarital marital sex, abstinence, chastity, any of that. I like to keep the main thing the main thing. Abortion is wrong because it intentionally kills an innocent human being. If I can't convince you of that, I'm certainly not going to convince you premarital sex is wrong. So I try to keep the main thing the main thing. Secondly, I don't think we should unfairly characterize people who are on the other side, who are abortion choicers, as just being selfish people. Uh, that's not true. That's not true. Some of them have thought deeply about this issue. I think they've thought wrongly, but, but they're not just uh, hedonistic tribal people who uh, operate purely on the uh, feeling side of the ledger. I, I think that would be an unfair way to portray them. Um, third, I think we need as Christians to make arguments to the culture that stand the best chance of being heard. And I think on the issue of abortion, the best chance is there, the best chance of being heard is first of all, show that you're not a flamethrower, that you're an intelligent person. By the way, I could be wrong on abortion. I could be. 
I could be wrong that God exists, right? I mean, we could be wrong on that. I don't believe we are, but we could be. I'm open-minded enough to say if I hear a good argument, I'll change my mind. We all should be in that boat. By the way, before any of you stone me as a heretic, you don't have to have absolute certainty that God exists to be reasonable to believe that he does. Do I have bomb-proof certainty right now that my wife is not in Las Vegas eloping with Michael Jackson while Elvis does the music? By the way, you let this out of this room, I'll have to kill you, and I'm pro-life. All right, now, um, the answer is I don't. But is it reasonable to believe that she is? No, not even close. Just because something's possible doesn't mean it's plausible. I think the evidence for Christianity being true with a capital T is absolutely overwhelming, as I do the pro-life view. However, I'm open-minded enough to, to, to show that I'll listen to what you have to say. I think, I think the secular world wants to know we're willing to listen. And that we're not just going to shout conclusions. So I like to ask good questions. I remember at the University of Georgia talking to two girls who were abortion choicers, not Christian, and we this is in our television series, Life is Best. You actually see this interview. We would ask students, do you mind going on TV? And we'd sit down and talk to them. Not one of them got upset with us. Not one. And these two girls were talking, and, and they said, yeah, we're really upset by racism and sexism. And I simply said, why are those things wrong? Why do you think they're wrong? Well, because they hurt people based on skin color and gender when those things don't matter. I said, I agree. And then very gently, a few minutes later, I said, if it's wrong to hurt people because of skin color and gender, why is it okay to hurt them because of size, level of development, environment, or degree of dependency? And you saw jaws drop. And they look at each other like, you take that one. <laughs> now, I'm not going to tell you they converted on the spot. And I think as evangelicals, we expect this. We think that when we do our apologetics right, everybody's just going to say, I am so glad that there's a God and that he sent you here to straighten out my twisted thinking. That's not how it works. Um, there was a movie a few years ago that uh, I won't mention, uh, uh, except to say that the initials were God is not dead, where the whole class, <laughs> the whole class agrees with a Christian theist. May I just tell you that does not happen? Uh, not to say the movie didn't have good points. It did have some very good points. But that scene is not accurate of the world we live in. So I try to engage people with questions. I don't know if I got to your question, but yeah. I'll let them pick who's next. Um, I think we're going to do one more. Um, and we'll go with you because you look really excited. I know, but they... Hello. Okay, yeah. Um, I have kind of like two questions. Um, number one would, not to be offensive, like offending anyone, but why is there not more women speaking on this panel about this topic? Um, and B, why do you guys like, this is generalizing, but why do we say that we shouldn't allow women who are like in poverty or like not going to be wanted and things like that when the rates for foster care, vic like children going into drugs, is like 40 to 50 percent of them and then going to jail is 60 percent of them so we try to say that we care about these kids after they're born but there's not as much action being put into place as we say can i take those one at a time yes okay good great question thank you um first of all on men up here more than women um i would say this arguments don't have gender people do in other words pro-life women make the same arguments i do and therefore, the, the soundness or validity of the argument stands on its own, not the person making the argument. Um, if we say only women can speak on abortion, we have to reverse Roe v. Wade because it was decided by nine men. And that would mean abortion rights wouldn't exist. So I try to avoid characterizing the soundness or validity of an argument based on the gender of the person making it. The argument stands or falls on its own merits, not the person making it. Does that, does that make sense? Uh, can I ask you a, quick a quick point. Um, first of all, I'm a girl. <laughs> um, second of all, the person who ran this event and decided to make this event and wanted to pursue this event was a girl. 
And the club that put this on is the 1776 Scholars. Half of us are girls, half of us are boys, and we both very much equally care about this issue. Um, so even though you don't see the work that was put in behind this, Chelsea was brilliant. She was the one who headed this um, because girls have just as much as a say. So just because you don't see the people who worked on this sitting on the stage, there's just as much as a presence with females as there were males in this process. Let me point out one other thing on this. Suppose I was an abortion doctor. I performed abortion six days a week. But one day a week, I come to Colorado Christian University and argue for the pro-life side. Could my argument still be sound even if my behavior was completely antithetical to the argument? Yeah, because the argument stands on its own. Um, there was a second part to what you answered about foster care. I want to make sure I understand your question and, and not misread it. So would you mind repeating it one more time? Um, I was asking why do we like generally like say that we care about a child once it's born, but like <coughs> the rates for children in foster care is going up, how they're being treated, and how they are outside of it is just detrimental to versus you know, what could happen. So I'm just asking, like, why do we say that mm -hmm. we care, but the statistics aren't showing it? Okay, fair question, thank you. Uh, you're correct, there is a crisis in foster care, and it's a multifaceted problem, and it's gonna take a lot of us working together to fix it. You're, you're right about that. Let me push back ever so gently, though, on an assumption lurking behind your question, okay? And uh, I'll give you the last word, just so it's fair. Uh, Make sure she gets the mic after I'm done, all right? And I won't respond to what you say. How does it follow that because pro-life advocates oppose the intentional killing of an innocent human being, that we are therefore responsible to fix other societal ills? For example, is the American Cancer Society fraudulent because it treats one disease and not many. What would we think of an after-school daycare program in the inner city that only took in kids between 3 to 6 p.m. weekdays? Would we say to them, well, if you really killed, cared about all children, you'd be open 24-7, and why only children? What about middle school students? What about high school students? No, we would applaud them for taking care of an injustice. Pro-life groups are flat broke we have no resources. And if we were to spread our resources even thinner, fighting other injustices that other groups with bigger budgets and bigger platforms are willing to fight, we'd be out of business tomorrow. Uh, so while as a Christian, I will care about a lot of issues, foster care, sex trafficking, uh, slavery worldwide, the mistreatment of women, I will care about all those issues and do what I can about them. But it doesn't follow that the operational objectives of the pro-life movement must be broad and inclusive as well. Does that make sense? You get the last word. It kind of answers my question. I understand that we can't spread our resources out, but it's, not a one step at a time thing. Like you have to look at each thing because you can't just make a blanket statement over one issue like that when there's a lot of repercussions that happen behind every single one of the decisions made. Thank you for asking your question. You're a great way to cap the evening off. Um, all right, I think with that, we're gonna go ahead and conclude. And if you have more questions, I encourage that you either get involved with CCU for Life or with the 76ers or even email Mr. Klusendorf. Um, and thank you guys so much for coming. We've really enjoyed tonight. So. Thank you.